Most of you probably saw the movie Home Alone. It's a classic at Christmas time. And there's a scene in Home Alone 1 where Joe Pecci is the burglar and he goes into the McAllister home. And while he's in there perusing what he wants to steal, he ends up grabbing one of the Christmas gifts, which was a kaleidoscope. A kaleidoscope is something that all of us are familiar with. Whenever you look in it and you turn it, you get a different configuration, you get a a different amount of colors that all blend together. What I want to talk about tonight is the kaleidoscope of God's Word. We're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 22, all the way to chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. And as Peter turns the kaleidoscope, we're going to see a different configuration of God's Word. He gives us a mini theology of the Word of God. Now remember, Peter is writing to a group of Christians who are beleaguered, they are persecuted, they are suffering for their faith. And in the midst of this, Peter is exhorting them in this section to love one another. And in the process of telling them to love one another, Peter gives six characteristics of God's Word. As Peter turns the kaleidoscope, we see different configurations of God's Word. First of all, I would have you note the person of the word, the person of the word. Notice, if you will, verse 23 of 1 Peter chapter 1. He says to them, for you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. Notice the person of the word here is God himself. God is the source of Scripture. Scripture is the revelation of God himself. Now, some people think the Bible is simply a higher form of human wisdom, and they would equate it with Shakespeare's writing or other writings that have been passed down throughout history, but the Bible makes it very clear that the Scripture is the revelation of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, very familiar, it says, all Scripture is inspired by God. The Greek word there, theopanoustos, literally means the exhalation of God. Really, inspiration is not the best word. It's the exhalation of God. In other words, Scripture is the breath of God. Now, the question is, how did God give us this revelation? God wanted to reveal himself to man, but how did God accomplish that? Well, 2 Peter chapter 1 tells us the process of how God revealed the word to man. It says, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. Here it is, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so the process that God used when he gave us the scripture was he inspired the writers when they wrote without violating their personality. And so if you notice the diagram up on the screen, it starts off with revelation. God wants to reveal himself to man. Now in order to make sure that his revelation was accurately recorded, what he did was the Holy Spirit came upon those people that wrote the scripture so that they accurately recorded what God wanted written, and yet God did not violate their personality in the process. And so Scripture is written by God and man. People ask the question, who wrote the Bible? Was it God or was it man? The answer is both. Think of an escalator. You've been at the airport before, and you've gotten on one of these escalators in order to save time, and what do you do? When you walk across it, are you walking or is the escalator carrying you? The answer is both. Now, I know some of you who are lazy like to stand there and just let it carry you along, but the fact of the matter is when you walk across it, it feels like you're gliding. Well, see, it's a dual process. The escalator is carrying you, and yet you're walking. And that's the same thing as the inspiration of Scripture. The Bible says the Scripture was written by God and man. God wanted to reveal himself to man, and in order to ensure that that revelation was accurately recorded, what God did was he sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit came upon men so that they wrote down the Scripture, and yet God didn't violate their personality. So that's why all the writers of Scripture wrote with different genres, using different vocabulary. For example, Luke was a doctor. He writes with classical Greek. 
On the other hand, if you read 2 Peter, Peter uses fisherman Greek. It's very difficult to translate. Why? Because Peter was not educated. On the other hand, Luke was educated. He was a doctor. And so, it reflects the fact that God did not violate the personalities of people as they wrote the Word of God. And so Peter here says in chapter 1, the person of the Word is God. It is called the Word of God. So we've seen the person of the Word. Let's secondly look at the power of the Word. Notice, if you will, verse 22 and 23. He says, since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls. Now, they obeyed the truth by getting saved, and when you and I get saved, the Bible says our conscience is purged, we are born again, our souls are purified. He says, since you've been saved, he says, for a sincere love of the brethren. In other words, when you get saved, you now can love other people the way God loves them. He says, I want you to fervently love one another from the heart. The word fervent there means to stretch yourself. It's used of a horse in a race that stretches its extremities. And the reason why he says this, that we're to love others fervently, is because some people are difficult to love. There are people that we all know that are EGR people. They're extra grace required. Okay, and we have to stretch ourselves to love them. So he says, now that you're saved, you have the capacity to love other people because God lives on the inside of you. And why is that? Why is it that we can love other people with a love that is fervent, and he gives the reason why, and he shows us the power of the word in verse 23, for you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable, here it is, that is through the living and enduring word of God. Peter here shows us the power of the word. What is the power of the word? It has the power to convert the sinner to salvation. What the Word of God does when preached is it convicts the sinner of his sin, and when they trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are converted. That is the power of the Word of God. You see, God uses His Word as the instrument to bring people to salvation. When I was living in Miami about 25 years ago, we were living on our church property. I wasn't the pastor, but the deal was if we lived on the church property, they had a place there. My role to get free rent was I had to mow the lawn, and I used one of those driving lawnmowers that you sit on. Well, one day when I was mowing the lawn, it died out on me, and I realized that the battery wasn't working. And so immediately I pulled up my car, and I took out some jumper cables, and I hooked them up to the battery of the lawnmower. And immediately it began to start up, and it dawned on me that the instrument, in order to bring life to the lawnmower, was the jumper cables. The jumper cables was the tool to take something that was dead and bring it to life. And that's exactly what God's Word is. God's Word is the jumper cables. God's Word is the instrument, Peter says that brings salvation to the sinner that is lost. In fact, Peter uses the word imperishable seed. Now, that word seed there is used, as you know, of a seed that you plant in the ground. A seed has inherent life within it. All you got to do is put it in the ground and allow the elements to produce what is already inherent within that particular seed. And that's the nature of God's word. Do you remember as a little kid when you would take the pumpkin seeds? I remember this growing up. My mom would have us clean the pumpkin out in October, and we would take some seeds, and we would actually plant them in a Dixie cup. And then, of course, I would look at it every day to see if that little growth stem would come out of the soil. Well, that's exactly what God's Word is. Peter says it's like imperishable seed. When you and I sow the seed of the gospel into the soil of people's hearts and they mix it with the water of faith, you know what it produces? The fruit of salvation. And that's the power of the word of God. And that's why, listen carefully, we need to be sowing the seed of God's word because it has inherent power to convert the sinner. A man by the name of George Whitfield was an evangelist back in the 1700s. He was well known. He was very theatrical when he would preach. In fact, before he came to Christ, he was in theater. And so he was used to acting. 
And when he would get up on stage, they said that people in Philadelphia could hear him miles away. He was very dramatic when he preached. In fact, biographers say that Ben Franklin loved to hear George Whitfield preach, even though Ben Franklin never became a born-again Christian. Well, there was these people that were attending George Whitfield's rally, his evangelistic crusade, and when they got done, they went to a bar and they started to drink. And one of them began to mock George Whitfield. And he took this book and he jumped up on a table and in a very theatrical way, he began to act out George Whitfield. And when he opened the book, his eyes landed on Luke 13, 3, which said this, unless you repent, you likewise will perish. And that guy was convicted immediately on the spot, and he got saved, and he became a traveling preacher with John Wesley. Now, that doesn't happen to everybody, but that shows you the inherent power of God's Word. It is able to convert the sinner that's why the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing a specific word about Christ because God's word is powerful. It is like jumper cables. It is like seed. It is imperishable. And you and I need to broadcast the seed into the soil of people's hearts so that they can hear the word of God because it converts the soul. And so Peter here, as he turns the kaleidoscope, he has showed us the person of the Word. Who is that? God. He's the one who's authored Scripture. Secondly, he has shown us the power of the Word. Thirdly, as Peter turns the kaleidoscope, he shows us the permanency of the Word. The permanency of the Word. Notice, if you will, verses 23 through 25. He says, For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and notice what he calls it, the enduring word of God. God's word is enduring. And then what he does in verse 24 is he quotes from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 40, and here we see the permanency of God's word. All flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall off, but the word of the Lord, say it out loud, endures forever. And what Peter is doing here is he's comparing God's word to man's word and man's accomplishments. And what he says here is that man's accomplishments, all of man's glory, all of man's wealth is temporary. It's like flowers and grass. We all know this based on the seasons. When you look at the seasons, you'll notice the grass comes in the spring and then it eventually dies off. Years ago, I bought my wife a rose bush and she planted it in the back of our yard. And every year, it produces these beautiful roses, but when winter comes, I notice the rose bush ends up dying. And then, of course, it comes to life again in the spring. And that's what he says about man and his accomplishments. Man, in all of his glory, is temporary. What man says is temporary. Man's wealth is temporary. I watched years ago a biography on a man by the name of George Michael, most of you know George Michael. He's a well-known pop singer in the secular world, and it was a very tragic and sad biography of his life. He struggled personally with homosexuality, and in the 80s, when it was sort of not popular to be homosexual as it is today, he went through a lot of suffering. But a lot of people knew about George Michael, especially when I was in high school. And then eventually, he died lonely, and he died very sorrowful. You see, that's man. Man has all these accomplishments. He produced a lot of records like Whitney Houston. They had a lot of glory, but you know what? They're forgotten now, other than the fact that people still hear their songs. That's the way man and his glory is. But see, Peter says that God's word is permanent. It lasts forever. If you study the Titanic, when the Titanic was sinking, there was a lot of wealthy people on the Titanic. And according to biographers, they say that a lot of the wealthy people, what they were doing when the Titanic was sinking was they were trading their money for fruit. And the reason why is because they realized as the Titanic was sinking that their wealth was temporary. They realized that their wealth meant nothing. What mattered at that moment was survival. 
You see, man in his glory and all of his accomplishments are temporary. They do not last, Peter says. They are like the grass of the field. They're like the flowers of the field. But he says this, the word of God is different. The word of the Lord endures forever. You know, a lot of people today publish books and they really don't last that long. In fact, one person said this about books that are written today, and I quote, only one half of 1% of all books published survive seven years. 80% of all books are forgotten in one year. For example, let's imagine in 2022, 200 books are published in America. Stats show that by next year, only 40 of those 200 books will remain. At the end of the seventh year of the original 200, only one book will survive, end quote. You see, man produces books, all these words, but they are temporary. And did you know that the Bible is the best-selling book? Because it is written by God and it is eternal. You cannot destroy the Word of God. It is permanent. It is indestructible. Why? Because it is inspired by God. Psalm 119, 89 says this, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. In Luke 21, 33, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Why? Because God's word is tied to who God is. God is eternal, therefore his word is eternal. Diocletian was one of the Roman emperors who tried to stamp out Christianity in the late 200s, early 300s. And he literally tried to wipe Christianity out. He ordered that all of the books of the Bible that at that time were written on scrolls would be destroyed within his empire. And one day, he went to the embers of a burning Bible and he erected a sign that said the following, and I don't know if I'll pronounce it correctly, extincto nomenae Christorum. And you know what that meant? It meant extinct is the name Christian. Well, within 24 hours, Christians produced more copies of the Word of God. He thought that he had stamped out God's Word, but in reality, he did not stamp out God's Word. Why? Because God's Word is eternal. And so as Peter turns the kaleidoscope, we've seen the person of the Word, we've seen the power of the Word, we've seen the permanency of the Word. Fourthly, I would have you note the preaching of the Word. Notice, if you will, verse 25 of chapter 1. He says, and this is the word which was preached to you. In other words, if God's word is powerful, it converts the sinner. If God's word is permanent, he's saying that is the very word that was preached to you. And the word preach here is the word for evangelism. You and I are called to preach the Word of God because it is powerful, it's able to convert the sinner, it is permanent because it's tied to God, God is an eternal being, therefore, Peter says, we are to preach the gospel to other people. This is evangelistic proclamation. One of my pastor friends in New Jersey told me his testimony one time when Back in the 70s, he was a surfer, and during that hippie generation, he would smoke pot in California, and he would go surfing all the time. And he says he was getting high with his friends, and he was on a beach in California, and he said this woman came up to him, and she began to preach the gospel to him, and he began to snicker and laugh at her. And she looked at him, and she said, young man, she said, you need to take this seriously. And so he blew her off. And he said, for the next couple of days, it ate at his soul. He said he felt God working in his life, and he finally gave his life to Jesus Christ, and God called him into ministry, and he was a preacher of the Word of God. And you know what he said to me, and it really hit me hard? He said, that woman is dead now. He said she had no idea that that day on that beach, when she sowed the seed of the gospel into the soil of my heart, that it would produce the fruit of salvation and ultimately lead to a gospel preacher. You see, that's the power of the word, and that's why we need to preach the word of God, because we don't know the impact it's going to have when we sow the gospel into people's lives. I think that's going to be one of the joys of heaven when we get there is to see all the people that we impacted with the message of Jesus Christ. A lot of times, we don't know the impact of God's Word. 
Now, the Bible uses many metaphors to describe our calling to preach the Word of God. For example, we are referred to as ambassadors. We are referred to as farmers. We sow the seed. The Bible says we are fishermen. We have bait. We are builders, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We lay the foundation of Jesus Christ. The Bible says we are witnesses. We are heralds. And we are laborers for the Lord. And listen, we all are called to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. You may not have the gift of evangelism, but the fact of the matter is God wants you to be bold for your faith. God wants you to take a stand. That doesn't mean you're a bull in a china shop. It doesn't mean that you don't wait on the Lord to share with people. But listen, when God opens doors, take advantage of them. This week, I had a guy come to my house. He was a young kid, and he was trying to sell me solar panels. And I said, you're trying to sell me solar panels, but I got something better for you. And I said, sir, where are you going to go when you die? He says, I don't know. I said, well, let me tell you where you're going to go if you don't trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He listened. He didn't accept Christ. But you know what? The seed was planted. And that's exactly what God wants you to do. He wants you to plant that seed. Now, some of you say, well, Mike, I'm not bold like that. I don't have that bravado. I don't have that personality. And you know what? The Lord understands that. The Lord has made us all different. And I understand we all struggle with sharing our faith. But you know what? We all need to engage in CPR. You know what CPR is? I'm not talking about the CPR with somebody who passes out and you help them basically survive. Here's what CPR means when it comes to evangelism. First of all, C represents cultivate. God wants you to cultivate relationships with non-believers. Who are your neighbors? Who are your coworkers? Who are your family members? Cultivate relationships with them. Get to know them and begin to pray for them. And then the second thing is plant. You have C, cultivate, and then you have plant. God wants you to plant that seed in their heart at some point. Pray for boldness. Ask God for a divine appointment. If you don't know what to say, use a gospel track. But God wants you to plant that seed. And then, of course, R is reap. Sometimes we don't reap wide array. We don't see that person come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. But you know what? I'm not responsible for the results. God is responsible for the results. My job is to sow the seed of the gospel. Why? Because it is powerful. It is permanent. And God is able to convert the sinner. And so Peter here, as he turns the kaleidoscope of God's Word, he shows us the person of the Word. Who is the person of the Word? It is God himself. Secondly, he shows us the power of the Word. The power of the Word is imperishable seed. It is able to convert the soul. Thirdly, he shows us the permanency of God's Word. Man is temporary. His glory, his wealth, All his accomplishments are going to fade away, but the Word of God abides forever. And then fourthly, he has showed us the preaching of the Word. And by the way, this preaching of the Word is not just sharing the gospel with the lost. The Bible says that we're to also preach the Word behind the pulpit. Yes, we are to share the gospel with those who don't have hope, but churches are called to preach the Word of God to the sheep. Notice what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is one of the clearest passages that pastors have the responsibility to preach the word of God to the people that they have been entrusted to. He says to Timothy as he's about to die, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, he says this to Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Do it when it's popular and when it's not popular. And when you preach the word, here is what it's going to do. It's going to reprove people. It's going to rebuke people. It's going to exhort people to certain behavior. And he says, Timothy, do it with great patience and instruction because people don't always respond the way you want. And Timothy, here's why I want you to preach the word. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. In other words, people aren't going to want a steady diet of God's Word. What they're going to want is cotton candy preachers. These are preachers that are going to tell people what they want to hear. These are preachers that have Genesis 1-1 sermons, formless and void. They're not preaching the Word of God. Now, Timothy tells us the method by which we're to preach the Word of God. 
1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 13 tells us how to preach it. Paul said to Timothy, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, and to teaching. In other words, he says, if you're going to preach the word, Timothy, there's three steps that you're to do. Number one, you're to read the text. Number two, you're to explain the text. And number three, you're to apply the text. That's the method of preaching. And so when Peter says at the end of chapter one, this is the word that was preached to you, we're not only to preach it to the goats, but the Bible says we're to preach the word to the sheep and we're to give them the nourishing uh, information of God's word. And so we've seen the person of the word, the power of the word, the permanency of the word, the preaching of the word. Fifthly, I would have you note the priority of the word, the priority of the word. Notice, if you will, chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Therefore, what's the therefore, therefore, on the basis of what I just said about God's word? Therefore, putting aside, and the Greek word indicates that we did this at salvation, but we're to continue to do this throughout our Christian life. Putting aside all malice, malice is ill will, a person who's malicious, we know about these types of people. He says, as a Christian, don't be malicious, put it aside, and all deceit, that means willfully deceiving others, willfully lying. It means to bait the hook, just like a fish, you deceive the fish. He says, put aside malice, deceit, hypocrisy, in other words, don't pretend to be something that you're not, and then he says, put aside envy and all slander. By the way, notice all these sins are relational sins. Why does he mention these sins? Because in chapter one, he says we're to love one another fervently from the heart. And you cannot love other people if these sins are embedded in your life as a pattern. And so Peter says, expunge them from your life. Get rid of them. And then he says this, and this shows us in verse 2 the priority of the word. He says, like newborn babies, brephos in the Greek, this is a new baby, just out of the mother's womb. Like newborn babies, here's the priority of the word, long for the pure milk of the word. You say, what's the priority of the word? The priority of the word is this. You and I are to long for God's word as a newborn baby longs for its mother's milk. That's the priority. And listen, babies, they don't care about the color of their room. Babies do not care about the nature of their crib. Babies do not care whether or not you put stuffed animals on the wall. Babies do not care if you put their name on a plaque on the front of the door of their bedroom. There's only one thing that babies care about. They have a singular focus, and that is what? Milk. And if a mother does not give the baby milk, the baby has a conniption. And we've all been around babies. And Peter says the priority of the word is we are to hunger for the word of God. We are to have a steady diet of fresh manna from heaven. And listen, we all at times struggle with the desire for the Word of God. In fact, I would say this, there's a lot of Christians that have spiritual anorexia in the church. And the reason why they have spiritual anorexia is because they're not drinking regularly from the breast milk of God's Word. Now, obviously, there's a sense in which we never outgrow the milk of God's Word. The Bible says we're to move from milk to meat. But there's a sense in which as Christians, we're always to desire the milk of God's word. Why? Because that is how you and I grow. That is how we are nourished spiritually. I was reading about a Korean couple who had a child, and they were addicted to this game. I've never heard of it before, but it's a virtual game where you raise a baby on your computer. It's a fake baby. And they literally were raising this baby virtually online, and they forgot to feed their baby. And as a result, the baby died because they were so consumed with raising their virtual baby, they neglected to feed their real baby. They ended up getting arrested and going to jail. Well, listen, you have a lot of Christians that are neglecting the desire of God's word, they're not in the word of God on a regular basis to cultivate that relationship with God. And you know what? They're spiritually anorexic. And listen, some Christians, they binge and purge. You know what they do? They come to church and they binge on the word of God. And listen, at Calvary Chapel, you're going to get fed. 
But they binge on the word of God. And you know what they do when they walk out of the church? They purge. Blah. Then they come back on Sunday, they binge, and then they purge. Blah. They binge and they purge. You know what I mean by purge? They're not applying the word of God to their life. And see, Peter says we are to prioritize the word like a newborn baby longs for its mother's milk. Now, I don't always desire the word of God like I should. Most of the time I do. But we all at times struggle with getting into God's word. And so the question is, what do I do when I don't desire the word like I should? There are times where you may not because you're tired. Maybe you're going through a spiritual battle in your life and you're really wrestling with God. That's the time to get in the word of God the most. But what can you do when you don't desire the word of God? Let me give you some suggestions to help you if you're struggling with this. Number one, seek first the kingdom of God. Let me say this very clearly. If you are not prioritizing the Lord and you're not seeking first the kingdom of God, you're not going to want to be in his word on a regular basis. Because listen, I will prioritize that which pleases him. And if I'm seeking first his kingdom, I'm going to want to get into the word. So if you have a diminishing desire for God's word and it's very sporadic and you're rarely into the word of God, that's symptomatic of a deeper problem. Ask yourself this question, are you seeking first the kingdom? Secondly, deal with sin in your life. We're not going to be perfect, but you need to deal with sin. That's why in chapter 2, verse 1 of First Peter, he says, putting aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Why does he say that? Because he knows if you don't deal with sin in your life, you're not going to desire the pure milk of God's word. And again, it doesn't mean we're perfect, but here's what it means. If we're not addressing sin in our life, you know what quenches your desire for the Word of God? is loving the world and loving sin more than you love God. That will take it out. To use an analogy, if a farmer is going to plant seeds, if those seeds are going to grow, he's got to remove the weeds and the rocks. If he doesn't remove the weeds and the rocks, the seed is not going to grow. And it's the same thing with your desire for the Word of God. If you're not dealing with sin in your life as a lifestyle, it will quench your desire for the Word of God. And then, of course, go deeper and study. Don't just read daily bread. Daily bread's good, but it's not enough. You got to go deeper. When you go deeper into the Word of God, when you get an overview of the Word of God, you know what that does? It creates a greater desire for the Word of God. That's why you ought to get an overview of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Because when you get that overview, you're able to take the individual parts and put them together, and I'll tell you what, it creates a greater desire. Listen to other teachers. And then there are times where you need to force feed yourself. You need to force feed yourself. When you don't feel like getting into the Word, it doesn't matter how you feel. Force feed yourself. Because listen, there are times where I haven't wanted to read the Word of God, but when I've read the Word of God, you know what it did? I'm glad that I read it, and it created a desire. And then finally, avoid leftover mentality. Well, I'm going to read right before I go to bed. You've been working all day, and I'm not saying it's wrong to read at night. It's a good thing. But if you've been working all day, expending all your energy on your children, your job, or whatever you're doing, and you're giving God leftover time, you know what's going to happen? You're not going to have that insatiable desire for the Word of God. And I'll tell you what, the longer you become a Christian, if you're not careful you can become less interested in Scripture. Remember when you were a new Christian? You couldn't get enough? You were like that newborn baby. But what happens over time is you lose that desire. Well, I already, I already know that. I've already heard that. you got to guard against that attitude. I have to guard against it. I've been to seminary, Bible college. Listen, the Bible is inexhaustible. There, there's always something to learn, and it's not just learning. It's God speaking to your heart. It's God communicating with you. It's cultivating that relationship. And so when you get those thoughts, you got to expunge them and say, that's pride. I'm not going to go there. Well, there's one final point this evening as we look at the kaleidoscope of God's word, and that is this, the produce of the word, the produce of the word. In other words, what does the word produce? What is the product of the word? Well, he tells us in verse 2 and 3 of chapter 2, he says, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word. Why? Here it is. So that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. 
since you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. You know what the produce of the word is? When you desire the word and you apply it to your life, Peter says the produce is it will produce spiritual growth. Listen, it's not enough just to desire the word. It's not enough just to read the word. We all do that on a regular basis, but here's the issue. Are we applying the word of God to our life? Instruction plus application equals spiritual growth, spiritual maturity. And listen, there is no way for you and I to grow spiritually if we're not routinely in the Word of God. It's just like a child. If you don't feed that child, they're not going to grow physically. It's the same thing in the spiritual realm. If you are not in the Word of God learning the Scripture yourself, properly interpreting it, and cultivating that relationship with God, you're not going to grow. And let me say this at the outset. You can come to Calvary Chapel. You can go to another Calvary Chapel or another Bible-believing church just sitting under good teaching and getting the milk and the meat of the Word is not necessarily going to grow you. Now, let me say this. You can grow potentially in a greater way if you sit under good teaching, but that in and of itself does not guarantee that you're going to grow in your walk with God. The way you mature is by getting solid teaching and then a taking that teaching and applying it to your life. And so Peter says here, the product of the word is that it will produce spiritual maturity if we are saved. That's what he meant since we have tasted the kindness of the Lord. You say, well, Mike, what is spiritual maturity? If you were to define it, what is it? Well, Ephesians chapter 4 tells us what spiritual maturity is. He says, so Christ himself gave the apostles gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastor teachers. Now, why did God give these leaders to the church? To equip his people for works of what? Service. So that the body of Christ may be built up. And then here's the result in verse 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Now, what's maturity? He tells us attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity, in a nutshell, is becoming more like Jesus Christ. And so the purpose of the Word and what it produces in our life is spiritual growth. As we nourish ourselves on the milk of God's Word and we apply it to our life, what it's going to do is it's going to produce service in our life and it's going to produce Christ-likeness in our life as we apply it to everyday life. Now, here's the problem with a lot of Christians. They never move from the milk of the Word to the meat of the Word. And again, as I said, there's a sense in which we never get off the milk of God's word because he uses the analogy of a baby and he says that we're to crave the word of God like a baby craves its mother's milk. So in that sense, we never stop craving the milk of the word. But there is a sense in the Bible where a lot of Christians stay milk Christians and they never become meat Christians. I was reading about a lady in England who was breastfeeding her child until they were nine years old. Now that's pretty disgusting. And you know what? There are a lot of Christians that are still breastfeeding off God's Word, and they're not moving from the milk of the Word to the meat of the Word. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He chided the Corinthians for this. He says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly. He says, you're infants in Christ. And then he gives the indictment in verse 2. I gave you milk not solid food, for you are not ready for it. In other words, when I came to Corinth and I led you to Christ, I gave you milk. I gave you pablum. I put you in spiritual diapers because you were new Christians. But then he lowers the boom on them in verse 2. He says, indeed, you are still not ready. You are still, verse 3, worldly. In other words, Paul is implying that time had elapsed. When I came to Corinth and led you to Christ, I gave you milk. That was appropriate. But he says, you're still worldly. You're still an infant. You still haven't moved to the meat of the word. And so a lot of Christians stay on the milk of the word, and they never get to the meat of the word. 
Listen, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's milk. But listen, I can take that milk statement and go real deep into theology. I could talk about redemption. I could talk about propitiation. I can get into all the doctrines of Scripture, and so you could take a milk statement and go a lot deeper with it. You say, well, Mike, how do I get from the milk of the Word to the meat of the Word? you got to crave the Word like a newborn baby. And listen, you got to learn the Bible in terms of an overview. From Genesis to Revelation, you got to get the big picture. And then you got to begin to dig into the Scripture, read commentary, read study guides, do all these things to go a little bit deeper in your walk with God. Learn theology. That's not a bad word. Listen, we're all theological. The question is whether or not you're a good theologian or a bad theologian. Some Christians say, listen, forget about that theology. Give me Jesus. And I say, who's Jesus? They say, oh, he's the God-man. I said, you just gave me theology. You cannot get away from theology. The issue is, are you a good theologian or a bad theologian? That's the question. So what's the product of the word? It produces growth if we apply it to our life. So Peter here turns the kaleidoscope. And as he turns the kaleidoscope, he gives us a mini theology of God's word. We've seen the person of the word. Who's the person of the word? God. He's the one who inspired the Bible. Secondly, the power of the word. It is imperishable seed. It converts the sinner. Thirdly, the permanency of God's word. Man's word is temporary. God's word is eternal. Thirdly, the preaching of the word. Peter says because it's powerful and because it's permanent, we need to preach it to the goats and we need to feed the sheep within the congregation. And then the priority of the word, he says we are to prioritize it like a baby prioritizes its mother's milk. And then finally, the produce of the word. What does it produce in our life? Spiritual growth. So let me ask you a question as we close. Are you in the word on a regular basis? And again, we don't do this as a legalistic requirement where we check off a box. You're going to have a battle. There's times a battle to prioritize the Word of God because we all deal with the tyranny of the urgent. But you know what God wants us to do? Make it a priority. And so here's what I encourage you to do. Have that set time every day. And listen, there's no substitute, watch this, for you getting into the Bible instead of listening to teachers. Don't substitute your time in the Word by listening to guys on the radio. Now, there's nothing wrong with that in terms of listening to others, but listen, they are supplemental. You've got to connect with God on a personal basis. And so if you're not in the Word of God, I want to challenge you, make it a priority, and go a little bit deeper. I would encourage you to get 30 days to understanding the Bible by Max Anders. It's a great Bible that gives a great book that gives you an overview of the Bible. He really gives you that bird's eye view, which is going to help you dig in in a more intense way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, and we thank you that your word is living and active. It is sharper than a double edged sword, piercing beyond the joints and marrows to the intents of the heart. Father, I pray that we would be students of the word of God that we would know your word and not just be intellectual eggheads, but, Father, we would apply your word to our life. I pray that, Father, we would have that hunger and at times when we don't, that we would, Father, continue to nourish ourselves on your word. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name.